Good afternoon. Happy Monday. Happy Thanksgiving week. Uh, we have a couple items at the top, and then I look forward to uh, taking your questions. First, today the United States is designating three ISIS-K leaders in Afghanistan, including Amir Sana Sanaullah Ghaffari, as a specially designated global terrorist. We're committed to using all of our counterterrorism tools to counter ISIS-K and ensure that Afghanistan cannot again become a platform for international terrorism. These designations expose and isolate terrorists, preventing them from exploiting the U.S. financial system and assisting with relevant law enforcement activities. Second, we welcome President Radov's clarifying statement today in which he re reiterated Bulgaria's support for Ukraine's territorial integrity and its sovereignty and makes clear that Crimea belongs to Ukraine. The United States, G7, the European Union, and NATO, we've all been clear and united in our position that Despite Russia's attempted annexation and ongoing occupation, Crimea is Ukraine. All of us, including Bulgaria, declared at the Crimea Platform Summit in August that Crimea is an integral part of Ukraine and that we do not and will not recognize Russia's efforts to legitimize its seizure and occupation of the peninsula. With that, happy to take your questions. Sean. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Matt Lee has given me the best gift anyone uh, could offer today. Happy birthday. 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 I appreciate it. Um, uh, could we start in Sudan? Sure. Um, the, uh, the deal that was reached this weekend um, with uh, Prime Minister Hamdok being reinstated. Uh, I saw the Secretary's tweet um, yesterday. I uh, wanted to pursue that to see uh, how significant do you think this is. Is this a, a breakthrough? And uh, some people on the street are saying that actually, effectively, the military is co-opting uh, Prime Minister Hamdok. How do you see it? And then how does this relate to United States assistance? Uh, the US, of course, has suspended the $700 million in economic assistance. Is that now, uh, is there some talk about resuming that at this point, or is that premature? Great, uh, let me say a couple of things on that. First, uh, we are encouraged. Uh, we are encouraged that the November 21st agreement is an important first step to put uh, civilian-led democratic transition back on track. Uh, specifically, we're encouraged by the release of Prime Minister Hamdok from house arrest uh, and his reinstatement uh, to office. But let me just underscore, this is a first step. Uh, this is nothing more than that, and we'll be watching very closely. And specifically, to build on this first step, we call on Sudanese leaders to implement uh, the agreement and key transitional tasks. That includes uh, creating a transitional legislative council, judicial structures, electoral institutions, and a constitutional convention. Uh, we urge the immediate release of all other civilian leaders and all those detained uh, in connection with the military takeover, as is called for in this very agreement uh, that was finalized on November 21st. We reiterate our call for the lifting of the state of emergency uh, as well. Look, the resumption, the reinvigoration of Sudan's civilian transition remains a top priority for us. Uh, we have been very engaged on this, supporting uh, that, um, that process, working very closely uh, with the uh, international communities. We'll continue uh, to press on all of the relevant actors uh, and stakeholders to work towards this goal uh, and to ensure that the first step that uh, was announced in uh, recent hours uh, is not the last step. Uh, to that end, I can uh, relay that the Secretary had an opportunity today to speak to Prime Minister Hamdak, uh, to speak to General Burhan, uh, and that was essentially uh, his message, uh, that we must continue to see progress, we must continue uh, to see Sudan move back down the democratic path, uh, and that starts with the reinstitution of uh, the Prime Minister. It certainly doesn't end there. Well, this goes to the uh, uh, first point, that this is a first step. It's not the last step. We'll be watching very closely. Uh, we don't have any announcements to make at this time uh, regarding uh, our assistance, uh, any changes to our posture. But uh, those decisions uh, will be predicated entirely on what happens uh, in the coming hours, in the coming days, in the coming weeks. So when you say first step, are you specifying like four or five steps before they can get the 700 we're, look, what we are saying uh, publicly, and obviously we are uh, communicating with the parties as well, 
including the secretary today. As you know, Molly Fee right. uh, was in Khartoum uh, last week now, where she had an opportunity to meet uh, with Prime Minister Hamdok, where she had an opportunity to meet uh, with military leaders, including General Burhan. Uh, but what we're making clear is that uh, there's a ways to go uh, before this process uh, is fully back on track. Uh, we are invested in this process precisely because the Sudanese people are invested uh, in their democracy and the democracy that they worked so hard uh, to achieve in the first instance. And now they're very clearly uh, taking to the streets peacefully uh, to make clear that their aspirations for democracy, for a constitutional government, uh, they are undiminished. Uh, and so we continue to stand with the Sudanese people uh, as uh, together we support that goal of a reinv reinvigorated democratic transition in Sudan. Yeah, well, today there was a protester was killed, uh, 14 others were injured. But that's not my question because Mr. Hamduk said that the reason he's back is to maintain uh, economic accomplishments. And uh, there was a, a, an obvious reference and the aid that they are receiving from you, from others, and so on. So if he put that as a condition that you guys will restore this aid, I mean, you know, we're confused on the time frame. I know you're saying fifth step, but we don't know what the coming steps ought to be. Well, we've talked about uh, some of those steps, and I, and I mentioned some of them in my opening comment. Yeah, exactly. Again, yeah. you know, to right. build on the first step that we've seen enacted, uh, we call for these key transitional tasks to be completed. Uh, tra creating a transitional legislative council, judicial structures, electoral institutions, uh, and a constitutional convention. Uh, so we are encouraged by what we've seen so far, uh, but this cannot, it must not, uh, be the final step uh, in what we see going forward. Okay. Were there any reciprocal kind of assurances given to Mr. Burhan that, you know, you will stay where you are, you will stay in position of leadership and return, you know, that he will allow the transitional process to take place? Was there any kind of quid pro quo with Mr. Brown? Uh, the uh, Sudanese stakeholders, they have spoken to the contours of this agreement. Our only role uh, in this was to uh, support, to encourage uh, productive negotiations to reinstate Prime Minister Hamdak. Uh, we didn't facilitate, we didn't mediate uh, these discussions, but uh, again, we were there as a uh, supporting uh, actor, uh, supporting uh, at um, uh, at, at our core, the aspirations of the Sudanese people themselves. Yes. Anything else on Sudan before we move on? Uh, Sorry. Sure. Quickly, well, on the issue of debt relief, um, that you know has been cited as one of the concerns of this um, military takeover was that it, it was going to set them back in terms of re receiving that debt relief as, as well as the aid. Uh, does it does this deal change your view on, on that? Well, again, this is a first step. Uh, and so we are still evaluating uh, the best path forward to support uh, Sudan's civilian led transition in light of recent events. Um, but what will contour our approach uh, is what happens next, uh, whether this first step is met with additional steps in the right direction, um, additional steps in the right direction and furtherance of uh, what the Sudanese people have so very clearly uh, been calling for um, by peacefully uh, taking to the streets uh, and having their uh, their voices heard. Uh, anything else on Sudan? Okay, great. Uh, Secretary Blinken has met uh, today with uh, Malcolm, Prime Minister. Uh, do you have uh, a readout for the meeting? We will have uh, a readout for you later today. Uh, obviously, our relationship with Morocco is an important one. Uh, we share uh, many common interests in the region, uh, plenty for uh, them to discuss. He's had uh, several engagements with uh, the foreign minister uh, previously, and this was an opportunity today to build on those, but we'll have a readout for you. On the Western Sahara, uh, the administration is, of course, they have uh, the UN political process. At the same time, they are still recognizing the, the, uh, the Moroccan sovereignty on the Western Sahara. Is there any conflict uh, in the U.S. position, and how will you deal with this uh, issue? Well, the Secretary had an opportunity to speak to this uh, when we were in Senegal uh, over the weekend on Saturday, in fact. Uh, and what he said then uh, is that what we support uh, is personal envoy Stefan de Mistura's uh, leadership in resuming the UN-led political process uh, to advance what is our ultimate goal, and that's a durable and dignified resolution to the conflict in Western Sahara. Uh, we have and will actively support uh, the efforts of personal envoy 
uh, Demostora to promote a peaceful, to promote a prosperous future for the people of Western Sahara uh, and for the broader region as well. Uh, we remain engaged uh, with all sides uh, to do just that in support uh, of this diplomatic effort. And we will support credible uh, UN-led political process uh, to stabilize the situation and secure a cessation of any hostilities. Uh, so we're consulting very closely uh, with the parties as we continue uh, to support Stefan de Mistura. And mean, meanwhile, you're still recognizing the uh, Moroccan sovereignty on the Western Sahara. As we said, we are consulting privately uh, with the parties and uh, supporting the diplomatic efforts of Stefan Mistura and the UN-led uh, political process. Two Americans who were released by the uh, the kidnappers, and any update on your efforts to free the other Americans? Well, uh, this is something that uh, since last month, mid last month, when these reports first emerged, uh, that as you know, uh, the uh, U.S. government and the State Department in particular uh, has been uh, deeply engaged in. We are uh, in regular contact uh, with uh, the missionary group. We're in regular contact. Uh, with uh, Haitian counterparts at the highest levels, um, both uh, at the political level and also uh, with, uh, within the Haitian National Police. Uh, we've been working closely with our Canadian counterparts uh, as well, uh, given that one of the uh, hostages has Canadian citizenship. Uh, you have likely seen the reports that uh, two of the individuals who were uh, previously held have been uh, released out of uh, concern for their privacy. We're not going to offer further comments, but uh, this is something that we are uh, and remain uh, uh, deeply engaged in uh, to try and see a successful resolution. Sorry. Sure. The Palestinian Israeli issue. Uh, Ned, uh, Ambassador Greenfield uh, met with Palestinian civil society uh, groups and so on. Which group did she meet with? Do, you, can, do we know the names of these groups that she met with? I, I imagine U.S. U.N. Okay. could get you a readout of that engagement. Okay. Now that she met with them and she said what she said, she issued a, you know, a very clear statement. Are we likely to see any kind of American pressure on Israel to sort of delist these groups from the terror list? Are you demanding that? Uh, Saeed, what Ambassador Thomas Greenfield did is precisely what the U.S. government does yeah. um, uh, from afar and when we are in the region. It is exactly what right. Secretary Blinken did. Uh, we regularly engage and meet with, when we're there in person, civil society organizations. Uh, we reaffirm the importance of civil society organizations uh, wherever we go. The Secretary did this when we were in Africa. Uh, last week, the Secretary did it uh, when we were in Ramallah uh, earlier this year, met with uh, a, a group of civil society organizations. Uh, that's precisely what uh, the but ambassador was doing. Yeah. In the meantime, they remain listed on the terror list, which just allows them from performing their function. Uh, How will they go about performing their function? Said, I, I think uh, you're conflating two issues. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I, I just want to understand you clearly. Are you saying to these groups, okay, that we are, we, we met with you, we're going to support you, we're going to support your effort, you've proven in the past that you have the kind of transparency that we can support. You and the Europeans, I mean, the Europeans are saying the same thing. So naturally, what the next step should be is some sort of an effort to delist them from the terror list, isn't it? Uh, Said, uh, the ambassador met with civil society groups. Uh, I think you're conflating the issue of the groups that uh, at, the, uh, 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 at the center of uh, the Israeli announcement in her meeting. Uh, but she met with civil society groups to reaffirm the importance of civil society all around the world, uh, and of course that includes in the Palestinian territories. The Israelis are also expressing confidence uh, you know, in the support of this administration and so on. And in exchange, are you going to sort of leverage this mutual confidence, reciprocal confidence, to sort of, let's say, perhaps give the Israelis to stop settlement, to sort of ease the checkpoints? You know, because you keep saying the same thing, we want both people to have uh, you know, freedoms and so on, and, and live in peace and all these things. But Obviously, the Palestinians are the ones that have to endure the checkpoints, have to endure the settlements, and so on. Well, we are fortunate uh, to have uh, a very positive and uh, a deep um, and strong relationship uh, with our Israeli partners. Uh, and through that relationship, uh, we can best accomplish uh, our mutual goals. Uh, these are issues that we uh, continue to engage our Israeli partners on. Uh, we're also fortunate to have a strengthened relationship uh, with our Palestinian counterparts. And as you know, uh, deepening uh, and reestablishing in many ways 
uh, our, um, uh, our ties with uh, the Palestinian Authority and with the Palestinian people uh, has been uh, a key goal of this administration from the earliest days. So uh, we've been gratified to see that Including progress as well. Including the of the consulate? Uh, we've spoken to this issue. I just don't have an update for you on it. Okay. Yeah. Russia? Uh, sorry? In Russia? Sure. Um, the Secretary on the weekend spoke again about uh, unusual military activity close to Russia's border with Ukraine and um, some reporting that the Ukrainians uh, believe Russia is preparing for an invasion. I wonder, you know, how likely do you, does the U.S. see that? What kind of analysis or assessment uh, do you guys have behind these phrases that you're using, like unusual military activity? You know, can you tell us uh, what is it exactly that's that's, ha that's occurring there that's giving you these um, these concerns? And you know, how likely do you think? Uh, an invasion might be? Well, many of these reports about the unusual military activity are in fact public. Uh, and so uh, the predicate of our concern uh, is available uh, to all of you, um, just as it is to us uh, with uh, information that is uh, both public uh, and some that may not be. Uh, but on the basis of that, uh, and as we've said, as the Secretary had an opportunity to reiterate on Saturday in, in Dakar, uh, we are concerned. Uh, we're concerned knowing that, of course, we can't speak to the intentions of the Russian Federations, of the Russian Federation, but uh, we are concerned because we are familiar with the playbook uh, that Moscow has used in the past. Uh, and if you look back, as the Secretary has said, to 2014, uh, you saw uh, Moscow um, uh, amass forces on the border uh, and then uh, claim a uh, pretextual uh, <clears throat> provocation uh, that caused them to uh, go into uh, Crimea, into eastern Ukraine. Uh, so that is why we have spoken out very clearly on this, making the point uh, that any escalatory or aggressive actions would be of great concern to the United States, uh, but not just the United States. We've had an opportunity to, uh, to compare notes uh, with many of our partners across Europe, uh, to do so in the context of uh, our NATO allies, but also uh, with our partner Ukraine. And of course, uh, the president had an opportunity to see President Zelensky, as did Secretary Blinken, uh, at uh, COP26 uh, just the other week. Uh, the secretary later engaged in a strategic dialogue uh, with Foreign Minister Kuleba, uh, where this was also uh, a primary topic of conversations. Uh, in each of those meetings, uh, not only did we uh, express our uh, concerns, uh, but we made clear our support, our unwavering support for Ukraine's sovereignty uh, and its uh, ter territorial integrity as well. And is there something, um, you know, is there something that you're that you're considering, some action you're considering taking that, you know, that could happen in the case of more activity, you know, short short of an invasion? Um, you know, are you are you sort of saying to Russia with? If this continues, if, if more if more activities like this happen, um, you know, this will be our response. Or you know, what kind of responses do you have? Well, as I said before, um, part of what gives us concern is that we are familiar with Moscow's playbook. Uh, what we don't want to do at this point is to telegraph our playbook. Uh, what we have said is that uh, any escalatory or aggressive actions on the part of Moscow would be of great concern to the United States. Uh, to our European partners uh, as well. Ed on the region? Uh, sure. Martin Brunner, Citizen Discovery from Poland. Uh, so, uh, what is your current assessment of the situation on the border between Poland and Belarus? Because, you know, this crisis is, is far from being over. Only yesterday there were almost 350 attempts to illegally cross the border. And uh, when are you planning to impose uh, new sanctions on Belarus? Well, uh, we are and we remain deeply concerned by the Lukashenko regime's inhumane actions. Uh, we strongly condemn uh, their callous exploitation and coercion of vulnerable people, of people who have been seeking nothing more uh, than a better life uh, with the regime's inhumane facilitation of irregular migration uh, across its borders. As I mentioned last week, we are uh, in uh, uh, close consultation with our European partners preparing follow-up sanctions uh, uh, to hold the Lukashenko regime uh, to account uh, for these hybrid operations, uh, but also for its ongoing attacks on uh, human rights, on uh, international norms, on 
uh, democracy or what is left of it uh, inside of Belarus. Uh, to that end, we call on the regime to immediately halt uh, its campaign of orchestrating and coercing, uh, co coercing irregular migrant flows across its borders into Europe. Uh, as long as the regime in Belarus refuses to respect international obligations and commitments, as long as it undermines the peace and security of Europe, as long as it continues to repress and to abuse uh, its people, uh, we will continue to pressure the Lukashenko regime and not lessen uh, and, and our calls for uh, accountability um, will increase. Uh, they will not diminish. Uh, we are uh, deeply appreciative of the leadership of the approach shown by Lithuania, shown by Latvia, shown by Poland in confronting the challenges created by the Lukashenko regime and its actions. Uh, and we stand with uh, the European Union. We stand with uh, our other partners and allies in supporting the democratic aspirations of the Belarusian people. Are you also in direct consultations with Poland? We have been in, in close consultation uh, with, our, with our Polish counterparts as well. Uh, these are um, uh, countries um, that, of course, have a right to regulate the entry of foreign nationals uh, into their territory, um, including with respect to these irregular migratory flows from Belarus. Uh, we've urged uh, Poland, we've urged Latvia, we've urged Lithuania uh, to continue to do so humanely uh, and in a way that is consistent with applicable international law. And the last one, um, were you consulted or informed uh, before the uh, phone calls by Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron to uh, Alexander Lukashenko and uh, Vladimir Putin? We have, a, uh, of course, been consulting closely uh, with our European allies regarding uh, the inhumane, the coercive um, uh, uh, tactics of the Lukashenko regime. Uh, that uh, coordination and consultation has been uh, very close uh, and, and very deep, um, but I'm not in a position to, to read out specific phone calls. How do you feel he has that long way uh, He returned uh, this weekend. He is uh, he's now back in he's now back in Washington. Sure. So as you um, alluded to, uh, we are continuing to uh, support uh, the diplomacy that, in the first instance, is being led by. Uh, President Ubasanjo, uh, the AU envoy uh, to the region. We've done that in any number of ways. Uh, Special Envoy Feltman, as you know, has had an opportunity to travel uh, to Ethiopia and the broader region several times uh, in recent weeks. He just returned from Ethiopia over the weekend. Um, he had productive meetings with uh, the High Representative, President Obasanjo. Uh, he also met with senior uh, Ethiopian government officials, African Union representatives, and international partners uh, to discuss opportunities that advance a negotiated and sustain a sustainable cessation of hostilities to bring this conflict that has now raged for more than a year uh, to a close. Uh, we have continued to call for uh, an end to the fighting. Uh, we have continued to call for um, uh, the uh, parties to engage uh, in diplomacy uh, in furtherance of a cessation of hostilities, uh, just as we have reiterated uh, the calls of the international community for an end to the human rights abuses and violations uh, that we've seen. Uh, as uh, we have also urged the provision of humanitarian access uh, to uh, those in Tigray, to those in uh, northern Ethiopia. Uh, the other point that uh, we have been consistent in saying is that um, our embassy, uh, as of early this month, is on ordered departure uh, status. Uh, we've reduced the size of our footprint there, but our embassy uh, is still very much open. Our USAID mission uh, is still very much open uh, and, oper and uh, operating to support uh, the people of Ethiopia, but in the case of our embassy, uh, to support uh, those with US citizenship who may still be uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, the point we have made is that uh, uh, Americans should depart the country immediately uh, using commercial options which remain readily available over any given 72-hour period, there are dozens of commercial flights uh, to international destinations uh, within Africa, uh, but also elsewhere, uh, that Americans are able to avail themselves of. Uh, and we encourage them to do it uh, because the security situation continues, of course, to uh, be tenuous. Uh, even as we have reduced uh, the footprint of our embassy, uh, we have actually increased uh, the hours within our 
uh, American Citizen Services section uh, within the embassy to help Americans uh, make those travel arrangements, to help place them on flights, uh, and uh, to facilitate the logistics involved in all of that. As we've made clear before, um, we will do everything from help them book a flight uh, to pay for that flight with a repatriation loan uh, should American citizens not be in a position to uh, pay those upfront costs. Uh, our uh, commitment to the safety and security uh, is a top priority for us, and that's why uh, we are working literally overtime to do all we can uh, to ensure that uh, Americans, uh, to see to it that Americans take advantage uh, of the many options uh, to depart the country uh, via commercial air. Sorry, can I quickly follow sure. up? So did Special Envoy Feltman meet with any members of the TPLF? We've been able to engage the TPLF, and we have engaged the TPLF, uh, but, but I don't have, did not I don't have anything else for you uh, on that. Okay. Yes, Ben? Uh, what do you make of the disappearance of Chinese tennis player Peng Shui? Do you have any concerns for U.S. athletes as they head over there to the Olympics? Do you think now is the time to call for a diplomatic boycott of the Olympics or any other sort of well, there have been a number of statements that have been made uh, on Peng Shui. I just saw an, uh, a recent statement from the Women's Tennis Association. Of course, uh, all of us, uh, the State Department included, we are closely monitoring the situation surrounding Peng Shui. Uh, we share the concern that has been expressed around the world, uh, as we all uh, want her, of course, to be safe. Uh, I'm not in a position to uh, offer uh, updates uh, from here, but uh, rest assured we are uh, closely uh, following um, uh, her and the situation uh, more broadly. Um, as, a, as a general matter, as a broader matter, we'll continue to support the ability of individuals to report sexual assault uh, and to seek accountability. And we believe that any report anywhere in the world uh, should be investigated. Uh, we will continue in the PRC context and in all contexts to stand up for the freedom of speech uh, especially in light of what we've seen from the PRC, and that is essentially a zero tolerance approach uh, for criticism and a record of silencing uh, or attempting to silence uh, those who uh, do uh, attempt to speak out. Should U.S. athletes be extra vigilant when they go to China for the Olympics? Are you going to issue any warnings to them? Um, do you feel that they are, you know, if they criticize the government while they're out there? Is that something you would advise them against doing? Well, look, I, I don't have an update uh, in terms of uh, our approach to the uh, Winter Olympics. Uh, there's still a number of months off, but uh, when it comes to what our presence sh should be, uh, there are a range of factors, uh, including the, uh, our deep concerns with uh, the human rights abuses in Xinjiang, uh, and we have talked about that both in the context uh, of our bilateral relationship, but also specifically uh, in uh, this context as well. Uh, our position on Xinjiang, our posi position on the PRC's uh, uh, continued uh, human rights abuses is very clear. Um, we have taken a number of steps to promote accountability for the ongoing human rights abuses, and in the case of Xinjiang genocide uh, there, and we'll, we'll continue to do that, but I just don't have an update on the Olympics. Follow up for yeah. uh, sure. Um, just the, um, the IOC president, Mark, um, said that he spoke with, uh, with Ms. Peng. Uh, does the United States have any um, assessment of that, whether is there any coercion involved in, and uh, I mean, do you have any, um, any general assessment of, of whether that was productive? I, I don't have any assessment to share publicly. As I said before, we are uh, closely uh, monitoring the situation. We are closely following uh, developments, uh, but we'll leave it to the IOC, to the WTA, and others uh, to speak to that. Yes? Uh, a little bit from Iran, please. Sure. Uh, Iranian Coast Negro, uh, Nicolau Negotiator, in an interview with us in Al Jazeera, he said, that U.S. must accept reality and left sanction immediately and that Iran is entitled to further advance its nuclear program, citing Article 26 and 36 of the Iran deal. Do you have a comment on that? I, I don't have a specific comment to that, and that's precisely because uh, the issue of sanctions and the issue of nuclear steps and nuclear restrictions, uh, that's at the crux. Uh, of what it is that the six rounds uh, that have been concluded of uh, indirect negotiations uh, with Tehran and Vienna have been all about. Uh, it's also why we have uh, very um, uh, consistently called for the resumption of diplomacy, uh, indirect diplomacy in the case of the United States, uh, so that we can determine whether we can finalize the remaining issues. We can build upon uh, the progress that had been achieved in those six rounds uh, on the question of, on the one hand, uh, the nuclear steps that Iran must take to resume its compliance with the JCPOA, and on the other hand, uh, the steps regarding sanctions that uh, the United States and the international community would be willing to take should 
uh, Iran uh, uh, be willing to resume its compliance with the JCPOA. So we'll leave that to the negotiations in Vienna. Uh, there is a, uh, there is some reports please, in the please. New York Times that uh, you, uh, the Biden administration is trying to give incentive to Iran by easing some sanctions to encourage them to uh, negotiate faithfully in Vienna. Is this true? Uh, we have been very clear all around that we are not willing uh, and will not uh, take unilateral steps uh, as sweeteners to sweeten the pot just to get negotiations going. Uh, a mutual return to compliance. Uh, it is in the interests of the United States. It is in the interests of the other members of the P5 plus one. Uh, it is also, as uh, previous governments in Iran have concluded, uh, in the interests of uh, Tehran, if we are able to get there. Uh, so we will uh, let the, um, uh, we will be clear that um, we're not going to engage in, in unilateral, unilateral steps uh, for the sake of just getting back to the table. Also, the New York Times reported that uh, U.S. officials have warned Israel that its attacks against the Iranian nuclear program uh, are counterproductive and have enabled uh, uh, Tehran to, to rebuild an even more efficient enrichment system. C could you elaborate on this? I mean, have, have you been in touch with, the, with, the, with Israel on this issue and trying to persuade them not to attack? Well, uh, what I will say broadly is that we have been in regular, uh, almost constant uh, contact with our Israeli partners to include on this issue. Uh, Special Envoy Mali uh, was just in Israel uh, last week, I believe it was. Uh, he had uh, an excellent visit there uh, where he engaged in consultations uh, with Israeli government counterparts and also with senior intelligence officials uh, as we uh, prepare to resume uh, negotiations in Vienna. Uh, what he was doing there is not unique, however. We have uh, regularly engaged with our Israeli partners uh, before each round, in many cases during each round, and after uh, each of the six rounds of negotiations that uh, have been completed. Uh, look, at the end of the day, the United States and Israel, we share a common objective here, uh, and that is to see to it that Iran is verifiably and permanently uh, prevented from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And we continue to believe that diplomacy uh, in coordination with our allies and partners, and that of course includes Israel, uh, is the best path to achieve that goal. It's the best, best path because it sets us out uh, on, a, on a, an approach that is verifiable and that is sustainable and that is permanent. Uh, and that is one of the key advantages that the JCPOA uh, conveys. So we will continue to consult very closely with our allies and partners. Uh, Special Envoy Mali in recent days alone has had uh, discussions with uh, his Chinese, his, uh, his Russian counterpart uh, as well. We have been in close contact with the E3. He had an engagement with the E3 uh, members on his travel. He engaged with our GCC partners uh, on uh, the travel, uh, during that travel as well. And in all of those uh, engagements, uh, there was a, a broad and shared agreement uh, that um, on the need for a mutual return uh, to full compliance uh, with the JCPOA. So do you expect the talks to, to go on without a hitch next, next Monday, a week from today on the 29th? I, I certainly don't want to be in the business of predicting how this will uh, you unfold. You don't see them being scuttled for any reason? Uh, yeah. As of right now, talks are still slated to resume next Monday, November 29th. Outside of the nuclear deal? Well, uh, we have been very clear that uh, Iran's provocative uh, nuclear steps are uh, of great concern to us. They are of great concern uh, to our uh, partners as well. Uh, we have made very clear uh, that these um, continued nuclear escalations uh, are unconstructive uh, and they are at their core inconsistent uh, with the stated uh, goal, with Iran's stated goal of. Uh, returning to mutual compliance with the JCPOA. We've also been very clear uh, that they serve no constructive end. Uh, they will not provide Iran with any uh, negotiating leverage uh, when talks resume in Vienna uh, next week. Um, look, we, um, we've noted with concern uh, statements from uh, Iran, uh, statements to the, to the effect of uh, only countries with nuclear weapons have taken su uh, such steps with respect to enrichment. Um, the JCPOA, one of, again, its core advantages uh, was the fact for us that it imposed strict limits, both on the level 
and the quantity of enrichment uh, of enriched uranium, uranium in Iran. Uh, and Iran's continued escalations, its continued um, uh, escalations beyond JCPOA limits, they're a clear reminder for us, uh, for our partners uh, as well, of the importance of it, seeing to it, uh, or at least testing the proposition, that we can achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. But did they ever face any repercussions for the repeated steps that you've, again, criticized? At what point are you willing to censure them for what they have done and, and make them pay a price for it? Well, uh, we have been very clear for a number of reasons, including for these continued nuclear escalations, uh, that uh, this uh, approach to the JCPOA, what we are trying uh, to test out in Vienna, uh, is not an approach that we will take indefinitely. Uh, it is not an approach that uh, we can or should take indefinitely because eventually uh, Iran's continued nuclear advances uh, will render uh, the advantage, the utility of returning to the JCPOA as it was crafted uh, and ultimately uh, implemented in 2016 um, as uh, not worth it, not worth it for the United States, uh, not worth it for our international partners uh, as well. We're not at that point yet. We continue to believe that diplomacy uh, pro provides the most sustainable, the most durable, and really the only permanent and verifiable uh, means of seeing to it that Iran can never again uh, attain, obtain a nuclear weapon. And so that's why uh, we are um, returning to Vienna uh, to see to it if we can achieve that mutual return to compliance. But, but short of that point, like why not censure them now for the steps that they have already taken? As you said, for a program that, uh, that otherwise would not need to take the steps, 60% enrichment, uh, you know, uranium metal enriched, why, why not censure them? Well, you referred to it. There is a Board of Governors meeting uh, in the coming days. I don't want to get ahead of that meeting. Uh, we have full faith and confidence in uh, the uh, Director General, Mr. Amano. We have full faith and confidence in the IAEA itself. Uh, we've been consulting very closely with the IAEA. The Director General had an opportunity uh, to meet with Secretary Blinken here at uh, the department several weeks ago, um, but we have been in regular contact uh, with the IAEA uh, to determine the best approach uh, and uh, the best response uh, to uh, these continued nuclear escalations. Mm -hmm. Americans detained in Iran separately from the negotiations over the JCPOA. Is that still the case going into this next round? That's still the case, uh, and it's still the case for uh, one very simple reason. Uh, we have gone to Vienna to test the proposition as to whether we can achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, the very fact that um, we would like to see this happen, but we are not sure if it can happen, uh, suggests to us very strongly that the fates of these detained Americans uh, should not be tied uh, to an uncertain proposition, and that's a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. So even as we continue to see to it, uh, continue to test whether we can um, uh, affect a mutual return to compliance, uh, we are working um, nonstop uh, to see to it uh, that these Americans can be reunited with their families, uh, in some cases uh, after years and years of separation. Why not make it a precondition, though, for a return to the JCPOA? Precisely because of what I said. Uh, the mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA is a very uncertain proposition. Uh, it is something that remains in our interests. We would like to see it happen precisely because it is in our interests, uh, precisely because it is in the interests uh, of our uh, international partners in the context of the P5 plus one and, and more broadly as well. Uh, but because it is uncertain, uh, it uh, would not be prudent to tie the fates of Americans uh, to, um, uh, to this issue. Uh, we uh, feel that by working these issues on parallel tracks, separate but parallel tracks, uh, we, uh, uh, in an ideal world, will be in a position to achieve both, a mutual return to compliance, even as we work uh, over time uh, to return these Americans to their families Sorry, as soon can as I we quickly can. ask one more? Was there any discussion on the fates of these Americans while there was a hiatus on the JCPOA talks? Uh, we are in regular contact uh, with our partners. Uh, uh, we are in uh, regular contact um, on the issue of these uh, American detainees. Uh, I'm not going to uh, detail the form, the channel that that takes, but again, uh, we have no higher priority uh, than the safety and security of Americans overseas. And of course, uh, that includes Americans who are unjustly held, as is the case uh, in Iran. Yes. He was in Kenya, Nigeria, Senegal. He said really great things about those countries. Jollof rice in Nigeria, Taranga hospitality in, in Senegal. 
I was wondering if you can go back to that trip and give us uh, the key agreement, achievement, and also in his discussion with President Kenyatta, Buhari and Sol, was what was the feedback like? Do they believe America is really back? Diplomacy is really back? And was the secretary given um, a new name and a traditional title in Nigeria? Um, and I have one more. Sure. Uh, so, uh, as you know, as you alluded to, the secretary uh, did return from uh, his first travel to sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I suppose it was late uh, Saturday night, early Sunday morning by the time we, uh, we got back. Uh, and it really was uh, a productive, a constructive, and excellent uh, trip to all uh, three countries. You had an opportunity to hear from the secretary in each stop. Uh, in the context of his bilateral engagements, in the context of his civil society engagements, uh, in the context of uh, his press conferences uh, with uh, his counterparts. Uh, of the broad agenda uh, that we share, not only with these three African countries, but uh, with many countries across uh, the continent more, more broadly. Uh, and in each stop, uh, you heard an emphasis uh, on the challenges that if we are going to be in a position to solve, uh, we have to work on together, uh, including with uh, the countries of Africa. And of course, uh, on that list uh, are issues like climate, uh, issues like COVID. Uh, it is achieving a sustainable um, global economic recovery, uh, including for these three countries and for the broader continent, uh, uh, countries that in some cases, uh, like many countries around the world, uh, ha whose economic growth uh, has, been, uh, has been stunted. Uh, by the onset of uh, COVID-19. We also share a number of uh, interests uh, with these countries, security interests, uh, our economic ties uh, in many cases are uh, quite deep uh, and have the potential to become even deeper. Um, uh, and in all three, we discussed uh, the values that um, need to be at the core of these relationships, including uh, human rights, uh, democratic uh, governance, these are three countries that, um, in a couple cases, uh, will have elections within the next uh, two or so years, and both have before uh, been a model for uh, the rest of the continent and beyond, and again, have the potential uh, to be a model when it comes to uh, democracy and democratic governance uh, for the continent uh, and well beyond. Uh, but this was a trip that was more than about just those three countries. We spoke to themes on this trip, again, uh, climate change, uh, COVID, uh, shared security challenges, economic ties um, uh, that are broader than those, three than those three countries. And they're themes that are transcontinental uh, in their nature in that they apply equally uh, to many countries uh, across uh, the continent. And in Abuja, the secretary laid out um, in a speech an extended set of remarks at ECOWAS, an important uh, regional institution, uh, the approach we take uh, to the continent, and that is one uh, of partnership, of true partnership. Uh, and he explained at some length uh, what that true partnership means. Final points on this, uh, we often think of and talk about partnership in the bilateral context or in the regional context, uh, government to government uh, partnerships. Uh, but our relationships with these three countries, uh, with many countries across Africa, uh, transcend uh, the official relationships, uh, and there are people to people ties. Uh, that are really at the heart of uh, many of these relationships. And that is why uh, this administration and previous administrations uh, have invested so heavily uh, in the human capital uh, across Africa with uh, programs like the Young African Leaders Initiative, or YALI. Uh, while he was in uh, these countries, the secretary had an opportunity uh, to meet with uh, several YALI uh, alums uh, to hear about their tremendous successes uh, in using the skills, using the connections, taking advantage of the experiences uh, that they had in YALI or other IVLP programs, uh, taking those back uh, to their home countries and really being leaders uh, in their own right uh, to help shape, to help craft um, the uh, more secure, uh, more prosperous future uh, that the United States uh, seeks to partner uh, with these countries and with the continent at large to achieve. Yes, uh, please follow. Yeah, I have uh, a second question. Uh, President Biden last week announced uh, that you'll be hosting a U.S.-Africa summit next year. Can you tell us more about that? When, where, who will be invited, and who will be excluded? And you forgot to 
respond to the question on the traditional title. <laughs> uh, I am I am actually not aware that a, a traditional name was bestowed, but if one was, I'll uh, I'll, I'll follow up with you on that. Okay. Uh, in terms of the uh, U.S. Africa Leader Summit, the pre the secretary announced this uh, in his speech in Abuja. Uh, and what he said, uh, what he spoke to was President Biden's intention uh, next year to convene uh, a summit with uh, the leaders uh, of our African partners. This is something that uh, the Obama-Biden administration did uh, in 2014, in August of 2014, as I recall. Uh, it was an opportunity to bring to Washington uh, dozens of uh, uh, heads of state, heads of government um, to deepen uh, at the time uh, our cooperation on the sets of issues uh, that were most relevant then. Uh, we are now some seven years, we will be uh, perhaps closer to <coughs> eight years removed uh, from that opportunity to bring to the United States many heads of state and government from Africa. Uh, so there are in some ways old uh, challenges, traditional challenges that remain, but in many ways uh, new challenges uh, that uh, confront us. Uh, and. Uh, the leader summit that the president intends to convene uh, next year will be an opportunity uh, to address uh, those issues as well. I know it's something the secretary looks forward to uh, and the president as well. Do we know when, when, where? We, we haven't announced a, a date formally yet, but we will as it gets closer. Uh, up then. Um, a new report came out last week that shows coronavirus samples from a cave in Laos had been taken to the Wuhan lab up to a few months before the virus broke out. I wondered if it was still the administration's position that the lab leak theory was very possible and why it was dropping down the agenda. It wasn't mentioned in the ministerial. It wasn't mentioned between President Xi and President Biden. Uh, has that just hit a dead end? I, 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 I would uh, refer you to my White House colleagues, but um, uh, I believe it was uh, a topic of conversation between President Xi and President Biden. Uh, not because, uh, and Secretary Blinken has uh, spoken to this, um, this is not um, an issue that uh, is solely about accountability for what happened. Uh, this is about preparing the world, ensuring that uh, the world is most prepared for, most resilient against uh, a potential future pandemic. Uh, and this is something that the secretary discussed uh, on his recent travel to Africa as well. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when uh, we have uh, another pandemic. And so that is why we are so focused on understanding uh, the origins of the coronavirus pandemic, because only by understanding what has happened in the past uh, will we be able to uh, best defend ourselves uh, here in the United States, but knowing that uh, these pathogens, these viruses uh, don't respect borders, uh, we have to uh, ensure that the world too uh, is as best prepared as possible. And so that is why you saw a focus, uh, including in Dakar, where the secretary visited the Pasteur Institute, um, uh, such a focus on uh, not only COVID and recovering from COVID, uh, but also building that resilience, building that global health security broadly uh, in Africa, uh, around the world, uh, knowing that uh, we are only as strong as the weakest link, li weakest link uh, when it comes to this. Uh, as you know, the intelligence community has uh, been looking at this issue very closely. They have now issued a couple public reports. Uh, I refer you to those uh, public reports, public assessments uh, for the current state of our analysis, but uh, I can uh, reassure you certainly that understanding the origins uh, of this uh, virus uh, remains a priority for us so that we can uh, best protect ourselves uh, the next time around. Uh, let me just go, let me just move around to the, okay. Very quickly, as the uh, Lebanese foreign minister met today in Moscow with his counterparts and so on, and he invited Russian companies to come uh, to participate in rebuilding the port. Is that, would that be fine with you? Would that, you know, would you look favorably at uh, Russian companies working in Lebanon, restoring, or, you know, uh, rebuilding the, uh, the port? Look, I would refer you to uh, the for, to Lebanese authorities for um, uh, details of that overture. I can tell you from our perspective, we've been working very closely uh, with uh, our partners, with our counterparts in the Lebanese government, uh, our partners in this case being the French, uh, being the Saudis, uh, being uh, a number of other countries, including countries in the Gulf, uh, who have uh, a shared uh, interest in seeing to it that uh, Lebanon is a country uh, that enjoys more stability. Uh, more security uh, and more prosperity uh, as well. Uh, we have been uh, working, and the president, the secretary, I'm sorry, had an opportunity uh, to meet with uh, Prime Minister Makati uh, when we were in Europe uh, late last month, I believe it was, uh, where we discussed um, uh, the issue of 
um, uh, seeing to it that the Lebanese people are afforded uh, humanitarian relief. They are afforded uh, the opportunities that for far too long have been uh, deprived from them in terms of safety, in terms of security, in terms of economic development uh, and prosperity uh, as well. Yes. Okay. So what will be the main agenda? And the secondary, uh, last Wednesday, the United States, Japan, uh, Republic of Korea had a trilateral vice ministerial meeting here at the State Department, but Japan skipped the joint press conference uh, due to the territorial issues between ROK and Japan. So do you think the bilateral issues had affect trilateral cooperation among the United States and Japan and ROK? And what's your take on the Japan's refusal to the joint press conference? Uh, in terms of your, your first question, the U.S.-Taiwan Economic Prosperity uh, Partnership Dialogue, we did announce, I believe it was last night, uh, that uh, the dialogue, uh, which is conducted under the auspices of the American Institute in Taiwan, or AIT, and under the Taipei Economic uh, and Cultural Representative Office here in DC, um, we noted that it provides an opportunity to exchange views on priority policy issues uh, when it comes to our uh, economic relationship. Uh, its goals are to promote further cooperation and growth in our vibrant and dynamic economic prosper, uh, partnership. Uh, through this dialogue, uh, it is our hope that we can explore new areas of cooperation uh, and identify ways to jointly uh, address uh, shared concerns. I expect we'll uh, have more to say uh, after the dialogue uh, concludes uh, tonight. When it comes to uh, the relationship between uh, our allies, uh, Japan and the Republic of Korea, uh, you're right that uh, Secretary, Deputy Secretary Sherman had an opportunity to meet trilaterally uh, with uh, her counterparts here in, in Washington uh, last week. All throughout, we have underscored uh, the importance of not only our bilateral uh, relationships with these uh, two allies, but also uh, the trilateral relationship. Uh, knowing that when it comes to all of our common interests, and we share many, uh, including a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, and um, uh, when it comes to uh, North Korea, when it comes to issues like climate change, economic prosperity, uh, and growth, uh, that everything we're trying to achieve will be more successful uh, if we have uh, a, uh, a deep uh, trilateral, trilateral relationship. And so Secretary Sherman had an opportunity to meet with her counterparts last week. Secretary Blinken, uh, on several occasions now, has had an opportunity to meet in a trilateral format uh, with his uh, Japanese and ROK uh, counterparts as well. Uh, I can tell you, and I think you heard this directly from the Deputy Secretary, uh, that the bilateral uh, session, uh, the trilateral session, excuse me, itself, uh, was very uh, constructive. Uh, it was uh, a good meeting. It was an opportunity uh, for the three countries uh, to uh, compare notes, to discuss these many areas, uh, uh, shared areas of uh, concern, to discuss uh, our common uh, objectives. And of course, you had an opportunity to hear directly from Deputy Secretary Sherman uh, in the aftermath of that trilateral engagement uh, to add a bit more texture and detail to those discussions. Sean. Sure. Um, uh, Lithuania, uh, China has downgraded its relations with Lithuania. Uh, Uh, do you have any reaction to this? Uh, do you, uh, is there any support that the United States could potentially give to Lithuania to withstand the influence of Beijing? Well, uh, what uh, I will speak to is uh, Lithuania uh, and it's the steps both it and Taiwan uh, have taken to deepen their cooperation, uh, including through uh, the opening of Taiwan's representative office in Vilnius uh, and Lithuania's plans to open a reciprocal offer, uh, office in Taipei. Uh, we see this as an important step uh, to expand Taiwan's meaningful participation in the international space. Uh, the opening of these offices will help expand economic and technological cooperation uh, between Taiwan and Lithuania. Uh, Lithuania, as you know, it's a valued uh, NATO ally. It's a partner for the United States across a range of issues. Uh, that includes our strong defense and economic ties. Uh, and when it comes to the promotion of uh, shared values, uh, and among them are democracy uh, and human rights, among many others. Uh, we reaffirm our support for Lithuania, and we're working to expand and deepen 
our already uh, robust bilateral relationship. Okay, a final question here. The UNDP uh, is pushing for urgent action to prop up the banks in, Af in Afghanistan, warning of a, a collapse within months. Uh, what's the U.S. doing to try to stop the banking system there collapsing? Well, we are working very closely uh, with the United Nations, with other multilateral organizations, and uh, in the bilateral uh, context as well, uh, to uh, uh, support uh, the needs of the people of Afghanistan, uh, when it comes to our uh, direct humanitarian support, you've heard us speak to the $474 million uh, that the United States has committed to the people of Afghanistan this, uh, this year uh, alone. We know that uh, the Afghan economy, uh, even before uh, the uh, fall of the previous government, uh, was in dire need of international support. And so we are working very closely uh, with the UN, with the UNDP, uh, with um, uh, other countries uh, in that context uh, and bilaterally and multilaterally as well uh, to find ways uh, to uh, offer liquidity uh, to infuse, um, uh, uh, to see to it that uh, the people of Afghanistan uh, can uh, take advantage of international support in ways that don't flow into the coffers of the Taliban. Uh, we believe that we can continue to support uh, the humanitarian needs uh, of the people of Afghanistan, uh, even as we continue to make clear to the Taliban the expectations that we have of them uh, when it comes to the priority issues uh, that, we've, that we've laid out. Uh, that includes uh, free passage, it includes its counterterrorism commitments, of course it includes uh, the commitments they have uh, to human rights, to inclusive governments uh, as well. So. Uh, we'll be watching very closely on that front as we continue uh, to support the needs of the Afghan people. Thank you all very much.